I'm Andrew Childs, and I'm a researcher studying quantum algorithms at the University of Maryland. And today I'd like to talk about the power of quantum computers, uh, what we know about the problems that quantum computers can solve, and also what we don't know, and what we know about their limitations. So to get things started, uh, what are quantum computers? Quantum computers are devices that can store and process information according to the principles of quantum mechanics. By storing information in uh, quantum mechanical bits, or qubits, which store a superposition of classical data uh, with amplitudes that can be either positive or negative, uh, we can represent and process information in a different way, and uh, we believe that such a device would allow us to solve certain problems much faster than is possible with ordinary classical computers. So you may think this sounds great. You know, you, you may want to know if, if you can have one of these devices and use it to perform these fast computations. Um, and it turns out that, well, you can't have one just yet, uh, at least that can run large scale, interesting computations. Building a quantum computer that can run interesting algorithms is a really hard problem. Uh, part of the difficulty is that to uh, run a quantum computer, we need very exquisite control over quantum mechanical systems. So we need to manipulate these qubits very precisely, but we also need to keep them well isolated from the environment so that they're not subject to the effects of noise. And these two demands are to some extent, uh, you know, in, in uh, contradiction with each other. And so, uh, you know, we need to, uh, they're, they're, in, they're in tension with each other. So, you know, we need to somehow find a way of doing both of these things well, isolating our qubits and controlling them, uh, you know, very well. And uh, this makes it very difficult to build a quantum computer. There is a, a very large effort underway worldwide to try to build quantum computing devices and scale them up to the point where they can be used to perform interesting computations. And there even has been uh, recent evidence showing that they can actually outperform classical devices, although not in an especially useful task, just at one that shows that they have, in principle, computational power. Um, but we are still very far from having devices at the scale where we could run useful quantum algorithms and actually apply them to solve, to solve interesting problems, although people are thinking very hard about how we can get there and what we can do with quantum computers when we get there. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, you know, what we know about what quantum computers uh, are able to do, because we understand the mathematical model of quantum computers very well, so we can think about their power and what algorithms they can run um, even before we have those devices. Okay, so where does the speed up from quantum computers, uh, quantum computers come from, and, uh, you know, what does it have to do with? Where, you know, what is the origin of quantum speed up? Well, this is a difficult a uh, question to, to answer in a, in a um, kind of concise way. It's a difficult question to answer at all. Um, but if I had to sort of point to one thing that's uh, you know, a source of the power of quantum computers, it's that in a quantum computer, you can have interference between different computational paths, much like in uh, you know, waves that can interfere with each other, uh, let's say on the surface of a pond. So if we um, perform a quantum computation and we'd like it to, to solve some problem, we somehow want to arrange the computation so that paths to the solution will interfere constructively and add together, whereas paths that lead to non-solutions will interfere destructively and uh, you know, will not appear in the final answer. So we somehow have to carefully you know, uh, choreograph the interference in our quantum mechanical system to do what we want. Uh, and this is, this is a source of the power of quantum computers. Of course, interference is not a fundamentally, you know, it's not a uniquely quantum mechanical phenomenon. We also can have interference, you know, for example, uh, on a pond. Uh, but what's different in, in, uh, about quantum mechanics is that it can give a very efficient representation of high dimensional interference phenomena. Uh, and this allows us to uh, potentially have interference in an exponentially large state space that can sometimes allow us to solve problems really fast. Okay, but when, when can this power really give us, um, you know, a, a fast solution to a problem? Um, you know, how, how general do we expect these kinds of speed ups to be? Well, um, you know, you might think that somehow uh, by, by uh, having a superposition of uh, all of the possible solutions to some problem, we could somehow arrange the interference to be such that we pick out just the correct one quickly out of all of the, you know, exponentially many possibilities that we could just sort of pluck the needle out of this haystack by, uh, you know, having having interference among all of the all of the possibilities uh, at once, but it turns out that this is not the case. So the linearity of quantum mechanics prohibits this, and in a certain model of this problem, you can actually prove that it's not possible for a quantum computer to very efficiently, um, you know, solve solve this kind of problem. So quantum computing is not the same thing as just having exponential parallelism. Um, 
more generally, you know, to get significant speed up from quantum computers, we really need to exploit structure in problems. We need to have particular kinds of structure. And what this means is that quantum computers really only give us an advantage for particular kinds of problems. So what we would like to understand is what are those particular kinds of problems? What are the structures that we need? There are some general uh, results about this. Um, for example, um, you know, it's known that if a problem is too symmetric, if you have a fully symmetric problem, uh, then it's not possible to have um, uh, you know, exponential quantum speed up. In fact, a recent result uh, that my group was involved uh, in showing shows that uh, other kinds of symmetries, like the symmetries of graphs, can also prevent uh, exponential quantum speed up. Um, and so, you know, we know something about the kinds of structures that need to be present to have significant quantum speed up. Um, but this is really the key question in general is what are the problems that have the right kind of structure uh, that quantum computers can exploit to solve those problems dramatically faster? Okay, so one of the kind of well-known capabilities of quantum computers uh, is, has to do with uh, attacking public key cryptography. So a very basic computational problem is that of writing an integer as a product of its prime factors. So if I give you a number like this, um, you know, uh, it turns out that the factors of this number are the two numbers uh, that are written here, uh, but it, that's a computation that's very hard for a classical computer to do. And in fact, that problem is um, so strongly believed to be hard that it's the basis of much of the cryptography that's in use on the internet today. Specifically, the RSA crypt crypto system relies on the assumption that this factoring problem is hard. Uh, however, in the mid-1990s, Peter Shor showed that, in fact, there's an efficient quantum algorithm for factoring integers. And that shows that once you can build quantum computers, if you can build them at a scale that's large enough to uh, solve uh, instances of, of factoring with, let's say, numbers of uh, thousands of bits, then you can actually break much of the cryptography uh, that's in use on, on the internet today. And this would be, um, uh, you know, would really, would really change the landscape of, uh, you know, security on the internet. The main idea of this algorithm uh, is that somehow the structure that's being exploited um, has to do with finding the periodicity of a function. So quantum computers are good at detecting periodicity. That's a particular kind of problem where they can get a speed up. And this is, uh, this is uh, you know, the origin of uh, the speed up in, in Shor's algorithm. Actually, related ideas can give uh, polynomial time quantum attacks on other public key crypto systems related to, uh, you know, things like the elliptic curve discrete log problem and other things that are used in proposals for uh, public key cryptography. Um, so uh, actually, you know, this is a more general thing than just the ability to factor. And you might wonder, is it possible to do cryptography at all in a world where we build quantum computers? Could we still have public key cryptography? Um, you know, could we, can we hope to keep secrets at all? It turns out that the answer is, well, we expect that the answer is yes. There are many proposals for public key crypto systems that are based on problems we think are hard, uh, even for quantum computers. And there's a, a, an effort underway uh, by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to develop cryptographic standards that will be secure even once we build quantum computers. So this is something we expect to be able to do. Uh, and I should also mention that also quantum information enables new kinds of uniquely quantum mechanical cryptography that um, you know, cannot, we, we, you know, we cannot hope to carry out in the classical world. So that's another kind of interesting uh, direction. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is explore some of the other problems uh, where we think we can get significant speed up uh, from, from quantum computers. Another quantum algorithm that gives significant, although much less than exponential speed up, uh, is Grover's algorithm for the unstructured search problem. So here we go back to the problem of the, you know, finding the needle in the haystack, where I said before that we can't hope for an exponential speed up. But what Grover showed us, uh, also in the mid-1990s, is that, in fact, you can get a quadratic improvement. You can search through n possibilities using only, like, square root of n steps. And this is a much less dramatic speedup than what we see in Shor's algorithm, uh, but it still is a speedup for a problem where, you know, it's, it's uh, surprising that you can get any speedup at all. And this problem is really ubiquitous. It shows up in a lot of places. And so this algorithm could potentially be used for a lot of applications. More generally, there's a theory of quantum analogs of random walks on graphs that can be used to explore graphs faster than is possible using classical information. Uh, and there's a framework for doing search using quantum walks that can uh, sometimes achieve uh, polynomial speed up over classical computation for other kinds of problems. So there are many applications of these sorts of problems that are known that use uh, you know, either Grover's algorithm or this more general framework of uh, quantum walk search. And because these ideas can be applied um, you know, for problems that have somewhat less structure, um, the applications are really quite extensive, although the speed ups are less. Okay, there's also been a lot of interest in using quantum computers to solve optimization problems. I would say this is an area where uh, you know, less, less is known than in the applications that I've mentioned so far. 
So specifically, there's a framework of what's called quantum adiabatic optimization or quantum annealing, um, which is a kind of general class of procedures for solving optimization problems, for you know, solving maximization or minimization problems by slowly changing the uh, quantum system to, to stay in what's called its quantum mechanical ground state. So there are some successes of this approach that are known. Um, it's possible to get the quadratic speed up for unstructured search that I just mentioned within this framework. There are some examples of simple cost functions that can be efficiently minimized by this strategy. And there are cases where even some classical methods like uh, simulated annealing will fail, but nevertheless, this quantum approach will succeed. But it's also known that this method can fail in some cases. There can be some cost fun functions for which it gets trapped in local minima. Sometimes there are cases where maybe the method works, but it can be simulated by classical methods, so it doesn't give a quantum speed up. And in fact, I think there's not, there's still not a compelling example of a problem um, that really shows um, that you can get a, a an exponential quantum speed up using adiabatic optimization, um, you know, with uh, with a sort of proof in a in a um, you know something like a black box model. So um, you know, I think the the um, ability of this of this method is uh, sort of unclear, and the sort of the the um, likelihood of getting useful speed ups from quantum computers for optimization is uh, you know somewhat unknown. There's a related approach which has received a lot of uh, attention, which is called the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, which is a variant of this approach that's um, you know likely to work with even smaller depth circuits. Uh, so I think this is also a, a potentially promising approach, but again, the, the power of this approach and its ability to get speed ups over classical algorithms uh, is not so clear. So there's a lot of uh, interest in better understanding the power of these methods and perhaps even trying to, to deploy them in practice. Um, but I, I think the theoretical underpinning of these methods is um, you know, something that's still under active investigation. Another potential application of quantum computers has to do with simulating quantum mechanical systems. This was actually the original motivation for uh, the idea of quantum computation, going back to uh, people like Richard Feynman, you know, who observed uh, in the early 1980s that quantum computers would be naturally suited to the problem of simulating the dynamics of quantum systems, which is a problem that seems to be hard for classical computers. So uh, in the quantum simulation problem, we're given some kind of a description of a quantum system. We're given an evolution time you know, that we would like to evolve the system for. We're given an initial quantum state, and we would like to produce the quantum state after we evolve the system for that time. This is a problem that we know how to solve efficiently with quantum computers. And we actually have very efficient, you know, very uh, well-optimized algorithms for this problem. And we can, in principle, use this to study many different kinds of uh, physical systems that are governed by the principles of quantum mechanics. So whenever quantum effects are strong and play a significant role, then we expect um, you know, that this algorithm is one that we can use to give an efficient simulation that would not be possible classically. We can use this method to study systems uh, arising in chemistry, material science, nuclear particle physics, and you know, other areas. We have very good uh, general purpose quantum algorithms for quantum simulation, and also good evidence that there will not be general purpose classical algorithms that will be able to simulate them in the worst case. Although I should mention that in practice for these kinds of applications, we do need to compete with specialized uh, you know, classical approaches that can sometimes perform very well using you know, um, sort of detailed information about particular kinds of systems. There's a lot of interest, for example, in trying to have good uh, classical codes for simulating chemistry. And, uh, you know, so much effort has gone into that problem that the bar is pretty high for what you have to com compete with. So, um, you know, while there's, I think, potentially a lot of promise here, um, you know, we have to uh, do a lot more work to understand uh, the advantages that we can hope to get in practice from quantum computation. A sort of related idea uh, has to do with using quantum computers uh, to address problems uh, in involving high dimensional linear algebra. So a very basic computational problem is that of solving a system of linear equations. This shows, you know, shows up all over the place in science and engineering and you know, even more, more broadly than that. So in uh, 2009, there was an algorithm that was proposed by Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd, uh, which has running time logarithmic in the dimension of the system um, that allows you to produce a quantum state proportional to the solution of such a system of different of uh, linear equations, um, but making some fairly strong requirements on the way the um, problem is presented and on the form of the output that's provided. So you have to have a, a particular kind of access to the linear system, and uh, you will only produce the output encoded in a quantum state. And then you know it's up to you to figure out how to use that quantum state to say something interesting about your linear system. Um, the core of this algorithm is actually quantum simulation, although the connection may not be so clear. Actually, this algorithm builds on 
the quantum simulation algorithms that I was just uh, speaking about. Um, this potentially has many applications because of the ubiquity of linear systems to things like solving systems of differential equations, which, which themselves have, have many applications, uh, the problems in convex optimization. There's been a lot of interest also in um, quantum algorithms for machine learning. Uh, here, I would say the ability to instantiate these requirements on the system and the usefulness of the, the state, states that can be produced um, is perhaps not entirely clear, but there's a lot of uh, investigation of this area, um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this uh, over the course of the conference. Okay, so uh, we've discussed quantum algorithms in uh, many different areas. Um, this is a short talk, and unfortunately, you know, we haven't been able to talk about all of the quantum algorithms that there are. Um, there really are many different things that you can do with quantum algorithms that, um, you know, exploit different features of quantum mechanics to get speed up over classical computation. Um, you know, we talked about the areas of quantum algorithms for cryptanalysis, for simulating quantum mechanics, for addressing problems in high dimensional linear algebra, potentially for optimization, although I would say the um, uh, utility of quantum computers there is perhaps less clear than some of these other areas, uh, and in search, which is um, definitely something you can do and is uh, very general, but where the kinds of speed ups that you get uh, are less significant. Um, so, you know, there are other potential applications of quantum computers that I did not mention. Um, you know, a few uh, selected problems are mentioned here having to do with applications in number theory, uh, in, in topology, in algebraic geometry. So these are, you know, various kinds of questions in, in mathematics. Um, problems having to do with graphs. There's a recent exponential speed up for graph connectivity problems using what are called cut queries. Uh, you know, there are many interesting things that are known about quantum algorithms that go kind of well beyond what we have time to talk about here today. Um, there are also uh, many problems that have uh, interesting polynomial speedups that I didn't mention. Um, so, for example, problems having to do with evaluating Boolean formulas. There are polynomial speedups for convex optimization problems, um, other problems in convex geometry, um, you know, for sort of better uh, exponential time algorithms for NP-hard problems. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, lot of interesting things that have been explored in the, in the uh, you know, study of quantum algorithms. And if you're interested in seeing a kind of more complete list of some of the quantum algorithms that are known, there's a nice website called quantumalgorithmzoo.org, which is a sort of curated collection of, uh, you know, many of the quantum algorithms that are known together with references to the research literature on, uh, you know, papers that, that have presented these quantum algorithms. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like to, to wrap up. You know, we have developed many quantum algorithms with potentially compelling applications, um, you know, many of which I've talked about in, in this uh, talk today, and, and some of which, you know, many of which I, I haven't had a chance to, uh, uh, to discuss. Um, but I think we're still very far from having, you know, anything resembling a general understanding of the power of quantum computers. You know, we, we know um, many examples suggesting that quantum computers have a lot of computational power. And, uh, you know, it's likely that there are other things that uh, quantum computers can, can do efficiently that we don't know about. Uh, and this is really an area of active investigation, you know, try, to try to understand really um, where does the power of quantum computers come from and what are the applications um, that quantum computers will have? Uh, and also how can we really deploy those applications in practice to do things uh, that are useful? Uh, one, you know, final thought that I'd like to le leave you with is just that, um, you know, much of the analysis of algorithms that I've, that I've, uh, you know, talked about here today really has to do with what we can prove about the performance of quantum algorithms, um, because we don't have large scale devices on which we can try out these quantum algorithms. So what we do is we use, you know, mostly pencil and paper to prove theorems about, you know, the running times of algorithms. Uh, and this is of course limiting, you know, it limits what, what we can do to the algorithms that we can, that we can prove things about. So if we could actually build a large scale quantum computer, which, you know, is something that many people are working uh, very hard at doing, then I think this could really change the landscape of thinking about quantum, quantum algorithms and impact, um, you know, the development of quantum algorithms uh, substantially. It would allow us to uh, do more to understand, you know, heuristics that perhaps we cannot, uh, cannot necessarily get a handle on analytically, but uh, perhaps nevertheless perform well in practice. And, um, you know, I think it would, it would also be, um, you know, very useful for sort of just exploring the power of quantum computers generally and trying to use them to, um, uh, you know, to come up with, trying to come up with new algorithmic, algorithmic ideas, maybe even that we could, um, could use to, to develop new algorithms with provable performance guarantees. So uh, that's where I'd like to end. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you a bit about the power of quantum computers. Um, and uh, thanks for your attention.